Perfect. Pick that nose and we're live. What's up? Uh, what's up, Seven Figure CEOs? We have an epic interview coming your way with Jeremy Miner here. Uh, he's ranked in the top 50 of sales reps around the world, has made over $2.5 million or $2.4 million per year in three different industries. He's an absolute savage with an amazing uh, watch collection. Uh, and we are gonna, we're going to hop into it today and just talk everything about sales. As always, if you have questions along the way, drop them down below for Jeremy Miner. And Jeremy, thank you so much for being here, brother. Uh, you know, I, I do have some watches, but I will tell you, like uh, one of my friends, Eli Wild, uh, you know, Eli, I saw him on one of your, your lives the other day or something. He went out and bought a Rolex the other day. I'm like, dude, why would you spend that much money on a freaking watch? Like my watch collection is our bright leans. And they're in between that like six to maybe $12,000 range. I just can't justify going over that. You know, like when the watch is, is as much as the Range Rover, I just can't justify it in my mind. <laughs> Eli is hysterical. I'll say he's not going to do something and that he does it. It's just so funny. I love it. Um, I just want to hop right into sales if that's okay with you. Let's do it. So... You, uh, I saw a post recently from you saying like starting out, you really struggled uh, with sales. There are a lot of things that you needed to learn. So yeah. I'm curious, what are those habits? What are those routines? What are, what's the mindset that you need to develop as a sales professional to be as effective as you? Yeah, let's talk about that. Can I give you a little bit of background on what I mean by that? Yeah. Because I'm more skill set than mindset. I'm not like a person that's going to pump you up or have you watch a bunch of motivational CDs because motivation is great. But let me give you a suggestion. When you call your prospect, if you don't know what to say, or more importantly, what to ask that trigger that person to want to engage with you, to want to open up to you and really tell you what their problems are, not just tell you what their problems are, but what's behind those problems? Like what are the root cause of the problems? How the problems affecting them? You're just going to get slapped in the face and all that motivation that you listen to with Tony Robbins is great, but it's just all going to go out the window in about a minute of every call when you get rejected and rejected and rejected. It just does not last that very long. So I'm more about skill set than mindset, but I am going to go over how to think uh, like a, a salesperson who makes seven figures years, like a W-2. I'm not talking about being a business owner, I'm talking about a W-2 or 1099 salesperson, okay? And when I say seven figures a year, I don't mean like they sell seven figures worth of sales. They actually get paid commissions, seven figures a year. I think there's a big difference. I see some people like, oh, I'm a seven figure salesperson. No, you're not. You just sell a million dollars. You Just because you made 150 grand this year does not mean that you are a seven figure salesperson. Uh, I don't know where that got downgraded, uh, but in our status, like we call it becoming a legend, you got to make at least a million dollars a year as commissions to get into that ball game. Like as a W-2 or 1099, some business owner that has 50 salespeople selling for you. So I got into, Andrew, I kind of got into sales 17, about actually about 18 years ago, broke burned out college student to give you a little bit of a background. Cause I think a lot of people that look at me like, Oh dude, he's got nice hair. I mean, you know, people put makeup on me every day. So he must've just been born with sales skills. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. I didn't, wasn't born out of my mother's womb knowing how to communicate. So when I get into sales 18 years ago, uh, I got my first job selling door to door uh, home security. And I thought it was going to be easy because that's what everybody in the office told me. You know, so I'm like, oh, this is going to be easy. I'm going to make all this money. Imagine this 21 year old kid, right? You're all excited, straight commission. And I started knocking on doors and I started noticing that and I was all excited and I was talking about the features and benefits of the product and how great it was going to be. But I started noticing from the very first door that I was getting a lot of objections and they would say, we can't afford it, Jeremy. We don't need it. Uh, your price is too high. I need to talk to my spouse. Let me think it over. Can you call me back in a week, a month, a year later? And I, I got finally to a point, this was probably close to seven, eight weeks in. And I still remember this because I, I, I want everybody to go back. Like, where did you start from? Okay. I started from like nothing. Okay. So I went back 
and this is after seven, eight weeks of hardly selling anything, straight commission, 21, had just gotten married because the girl I was dating was pregnant. We just got married, had a kid on the way, 21 year old kid. I like have to be responsible, okay? I'm sitting on the curb one night, the manager's about to pick me up. I had worked 12 hours that day, made zero sales. Zero freaking sales. It's the middle of July, it's 100 degrees, I've got drenched sweat down my shirt. Can you imagine? I'm sitting on the curve. My legs are just like aching from walking all day, door to door to door, pounding on these doors. That week, I had made one sale. So I made like $200 for the week. I probably worked 80 hours, okay? So at that point, I'm like, okay, I'm a failure, realistically, right? Um, how could I go home to my wife at that time and our little girl and say, hey, we don't have enough money to pay for the rent in a couple of weeks. Like growing up to move in with your parents, how embarrassing, right? And I remember like even like rubbing my feet like on the concrete and feeling the heat. My manager picked me up that night and he popped in a Tony Robbins CD. Here I'm talking about motivation. He popped in a Tony Robbins CD and Tony said something like this. And I, I might be, uh, you know, breaking this up, but he said, most people fail for the simple reason they don't learn the right skills necessary to succeed. They don't learn the right skills. Now he goes on to say that everybody's taught skills, but the people who fail are the ones who were not taught the right ones. And so it, it was kind of like a light bulb went off into my head that maybe what the company was training me and what I call now the old gurus were training me from these books they had me read, maybe they just weren't the right skills. Maybe they just didn't work anymore, okay? So I committed at that point to myself and my family that I was gonna have to learn new skills because I know that everybody on here, you know, if you're like me, you wanna provide for your family as well. So that's kind of how my story got started. Zero, learn the hard way that what I was being taught were not the right skills, obviously, and I had to learn a new way. Yeah, I love it. So it's skill set, not mindset. And you yeah. dove a little bit into it with um, being able to extract problems from the prospect. So I'd love to hop into that is what is the skill set necessary to be able to extract the skill sets or the, uh, the problems from the prospect? Yeah, let me do this. So I will, uh, I want everybody to write this down. This will really help you. So in what we call the new model of selling, uh, my methodology, it's called NEPQ stands for Neuro Emotional Persuasion Questions or AKA the new model of selling. There are five main principles and these are about the mindset. So number one is we have to become a problem finder and problem solver, not a product pusher. So number one is we have to become a problem finder, problem solver, not a product pusher. Number two is we have to learn how to ask the right questions at the right time. And number three, we have to listen to what they mean not just what they say. That's very important. Most people don't know how to do that. Listening to what is meant when they answer the question, not just what they're saying. Fourth principle is feedback and commitment. Fifth is eliminating sales pressure. So let's talk about the first one first. I think it's probably one of the most important ones. And when I'm at events, you know, this is pre-COVID when I was doing live events. Uh, when I was at live events, I would always ask the audience, one of the first questions I would ask is I would say, why are you a salesperson? Like, what are you in sales for? Or like, if there were business owners that I was talking to, what is the purpose of you being in business? And everybody would say, to make more money, Jeremy, to make a bunch of money, I wanna get rich, I wanna drive a Lambo, or I wanna have more time, I, I wanna be able to travel the world, I wanna do all this stuff. That's typically what most people would say. Uh, but if you answered, like if you answered that question in that way, so everybody here, like I want to ask you, why are you in sales or why are you a coach? I know you help a lot of coach and course creators. So why do you have a business? Like, why are you a coach? What is the purpose of you even starting a business? Now, if you answered more about like how you want to make more money or have more time, ask yourself this question on whom was your answer more focused on? Was it more focused on you and what you want, your agenda? or is it more focused on your potential customer? Now, most likely when I'm at events, it's focused on them and their own agenda. However, the fact is you're not in business for you, you're only in business for other people. So principle number one of you being in business is to find and help other people solve their problems. Now, I want each of you to do this. I always do this exercise at, at an event. 
Do your potential clients in your industry have problems? Think about it, okay? I want each of you to take 10 seconds, write down two problems that you know your prospects have. What are the top two problems that your prospects have? Think about those or write those down. Look at those two problems, whatever you do, whatever you coach, okay? And ask yourself this question. Does your solution solve those? Okay, so wherever you're setting at virtually, raise your hand and or put in the message here like, yes, my solution solves these two problems, okay? So what I typically hear most people say at events or even virtual events now is that their prospects all have problems. They have the solution to solve those. So the question is, if your prospects have problems and your solution solves those, why are they not buying from you? What's the missing link? Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Okay. I'm always making suggestions. The missing link is not your leads. It's not your mindset. You don't need to read 12 personal development books every week. It's not that you don't get pumped up or motivated enough. It's what the missing link is what you're saying or more importantly, not asking on your calls that's causing your prospects to run the other way and not buy your solution. And if they don't buy from you, then you can't solve their problems. But once you learn the right things to say and you learn the right questions to ask in that step-by-step -step structure, okay, what becomes possible? Well, you can make double and triple and quadruple your income and your business literally overnight. Because we have to remember this, as sales professionals, as coaches or creators, I know you, all these people are on here, business owners, coaches, creators, they're selling every day, right? So in our day and age, you have to think like a problem finder and problem solver, because in our time, we call this the post-trust era. Okay, I've got a book coming out about this. You can't be just good at solving problems. You now have to be better at problem finding. Now, what does that mean? That means asking the right questions at the right time that help them uncover challenges and problems that they might not have even thought they had. One thing we have to realize, most of your prospects don't even realize they have a problem when you first talk to them. Or maybe they know about a problem, but they don't know how bad it really is or how bad the problem can be if they don't do anything about it. Because if you can't help them uncover their problems in their mind, it's impossible for them to feel like you can get them the results they want. Does that make sense? Totally. Am I boring everybody? No, they're, they're, they're loving it, dude. <laughs> my, my question is yeah. what are, I know the questions need to be asked at the right time. What are some of those very strategic questions that you like to ask to uncover those problems? Yeah. Well, it's all a process. Okay. So in, in our training course, like an inner PQ sales training course, it's all structure because a lot of salespeople wing it on every call. Like they might say something different, might ask some different questions on every call and they wing it. And then they hope and pray that something they're going to say in that presentation, or they call it a pitch. I hate that word. is somehow going to trigger the person to magically want to buy them. And I call that hopium. It's a drug that so many salespeople and coaches are on where they just hope and pray something they're saying is going to stick and they're going to buy. So what we teach is a structure. We first teach, and I'll give you an overview and then a few examples if your people want them. We teach first what are called connecting questions, okay? Connecting questions take the focus off of you and put it on your potential customer, okay? The second thing we teach are what are called situation questions. Situation questions help you and them Find out what their present situation actually is right now. What is what we call their current state, okay? Then we go into problem awareness questions. Problem awareness questions help them and you find out what their real problems are, maybe problems they didn't even know they had, the root cause of those problems. Most salespeople don't know how to get the root cause to surface level, and then how those problems are affecting them personally. That's where people start to attach to wanting to solve that because their emotion comes out, okay? Then we go into what are called solution awareness questions that help them focus on what we call their future state or where they want to go, okay? Like once this problem is solved, what's possible for them? We call the solution awareness questions. And then we go back into what are called consequence questions. And these help the prospect 
question their way of thinking that's allowed the problem to still happen and find out what are the potential consequences if they don't do anything. Let me give you an example. Uh, let's say that you're selling, hell, I don't know, let's say a fitness coaching or something like that or diet coaching. You probably have some people that sell that in here, right? Cor sure. Course creators. So John, what, what are you going to do though if nothing, if nothing changes and you don't lose this 30 pounds over the next three, four, or six months? That's a consequence question. Now, you don't just ask that on the first 10 seconds of the call. That's more in the body of the call. But you're asking a consequence question that makes them feel like, what are the ramifications or consequences if they don't do anything? What are, what are the possible ramifications if you don't do anything about this and you continually gain this weight? That's a consequence question. Okay, you can re reword it many different times. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Then we're going to go, I know this is all sounds kind of techie, but a lot of science behind this. Then after consequence questions, we transition into the presentation. That's about 10% of the conversation. And we feed back what they said they wanted and how our solution solves each of the problems they said they had. Okay. So it aligns nothing more, nothing less. Okay. The more you go off into tangents on this benefit and that, the more you're losing that customer. Okay. And then we simply ask what are called commitment questions that get them to commit to take the next step and purchase what you're offering. It's that simple of a process, seven step process. With me. Nailed it. So one of the questions I was going to ask you is uh, around asking the questions at the right time. And yeah. you just went through your format right there, the mm -hmm. seven step process in that order, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool, love it. And I love what you're doing here with uh, number one, checking in, asking, yeah. hey, does that make sense? Yeah. And number two, asking for permission, gaining permission from me before we move forward. Yeah, those are called checking for agreement questions. Yeah. Right? So it allows you to keep the pulse of what's going on in the conversation. They feel like they have the control, but really who has the control? You do. You're just a facilitator taking them down this journey of self-discovery, right? And they're discovering that they have all these problems they didn't even know about. You're the only person that's helped them even see this. So do you think that they're going to attach to you and want to do business with you because they feel like you can get them the results Whereas all these other competitors are just wham, bam, try to, you know, choke them by the tie and until they buy type of mentality. And they treat them, they commoditize all those salespeople and compete on price. You can charge 50% more and they're still going to buy from you over somebody else because they feel that you can get them the results. It's not about likability. People buy in our day based on how much they feel that you can get them the results they want. They care less if they like you. Like I could buy from grandma. I love grandma, but I'm necessarily going to buy from grandma over the expert that said that can do the same thing that grandma says she can do. Yeah, I love it. And, and you have like such a strong frame. Like yeah. we, we came into this interview and I was like, hey, let's go this direction. You turned it around, told a little bit of your story first to uh, get that in set that frame. So I love it. So like how can sales reps um, how do they set a good frame, a good tempo right at the beginning of the call yeah. um, to have a strong frame and make sure that they're leading the sales call? Yeah. And I, the only reason why I, I tell a little bit about my background, I, I think a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, this you know guy when he was in sales made close to 3 million bucks a year. He must've just been born with that ability and just, yeah, I mean, started from zero, like I almost quit my first sales job. If I had yeah. done that, I wouldn't be on here. I'd be working at Wendy's or something, you know, like yeah. certain well, what I love about that is you didn't let me lead you. Like, ah, okay. Back, that makes sense. Back, yeah. back in control. Yeah. Yeah. So like same thing with a sales call. Yeah. Like how do you set the frame? And if it's going down the wrong path, how do you reset the frame with the prospect? Yeah. So, so it's just, it's just the structure of questions, right? So when you first call, let's say if it's an inbound lead and, and like I said, we train a lot of people in the coaching space as well as everything else you can think of at, at this point. So let's say that they book on a call, you're calling them back. Hey, Hey John, uh, just Andrew looks like you'd booked on my calendar today. Um, about looking how to possibly monetize, you know, your uh, Facebook group. And I, I had time to get to you. Now, I was just curious, um, and we can go through some of the details if you'd like. When you went through the ad the other day, 
where you saw X and Y and Z. Um, I guess what, what was it about the ad that attracted your attention? Did you see like how I made that question go a lot longer and more deeper by my pausing right there? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you, when, now let me give you another example. Let's say if I did it this way with the wrong tonality. Uh, looks like you responded to one of my ads about uh, monetizing your Facebook group. Just had the time to get back to you. Okay, look, got your application now. I was just curious when you went through the ad, what was it about the ad that attracted your attention? Mm -hmm. I just said the same words but it's how I said those words. Mm -hmm. It's the pausing, verbal pausing. It's the tone. It's certain words that I'm overemphasizing that triggers them to think deeper about my question, okay? Um, so that's how you, and I, I know a lot of coaches call it a frame or whatever. I'm not used to that because I'm not coming from different spaces, right? So they call it a frame. To me, it's just, it's just the structure of the call, connecting questions then to situation questions. Now. Let's say you get on there with an A-type personality, like, well, just tell me what it's all about. Like, what's it gonna cost? What's it all about? Yeah, no problem. I can go through um, those details um, if you'd like for sure. But John, to be frank, I'm not quite sure I can even help you yet. Um, I'd have to know a little bit more uh, about what you're currently doing right now, like inside your Facebook group, um, just to see if I can even help you in the first place. For example, and then I'd go into my first situation question. Now, did you see how I asked, I said that, I said that statement to diffuse that? I, I stepped back and said, well, to be frank, I'm not quite sure I can even help you yet. When you say that, you're coming as an unbiased, uh, in an unbiased frame, I guess you can call it. And when they feel that you're unbiased, you don't know if you can help them, they start to do what? They open up, because they don't feel the pressure. Now, if you get on the call and be like, at the end of the day, you know, at the end of this call, you're going to make a decision. Either this is what you're looking for or it's not what you're looking for, and you can make an educated decision. You're just triggering sales resistance that whole call because the whole time, if you say that in the beginning of the call, the frame, I hear so many coaches do that. I'm like, God, you're losing so many freaking sales. You guys are crazy idiots. Uh, sorry, I get a little bit weird. But I'm just like, you're triggering resistance right from the beginning of the call because they're like, oh gosh, I'm not gonna open up, and it causes them to shut down unless they're just an easy sale. Most people are not easy sales. You're gonna get the 10 to 20%, but what you say and ask, that other 80% can go either to your side of the fence or the other side and stay in status quo and not do anything, right? So when you trigger sales resistance like that by making those statements, they close down most of the call, and then when you get to the end, I need to think about it. I still need to talk to my spouse and it's over. So you have to learn how to eliminate certain words in your vocabulary that trigger sales resistance and use what we call more neutral languaging. Mm. So good. So when, when you feel like you're losing control of the sales call, yeah. what are some things that we can do there? Uh, when, yeah, I will tell you, once you learn an EPQ, you're yeah. rarely going to lose control of any sales call. <laughs> I know that sounds unbelievable. Yeah, most of them are go your way. I'm through it. So yeah, they're they're really good. Yeah, yeah, most of them go your way because I know that we train some of the people that that work with you because they're they view themselves as problem finders and problem solvers. They're helping your people solve their problems, and if they can't help them find and solve those problems, guess what happens to your clients, Andrew? They stay in status quo and nothing ever changes for them, and they still can't make the money they want, they still can't monetize the group that they want, and nothing ever changes, right? So what, what typically you do, like if the call's going off track, I just, we, I would stop the call. You know, this is like riding a bike for me, and I would simply say this. You seem a bit hesitant. What's behind that? Mm. Every time. And when you ask that question, they're going to open up to you like, well, I really like this, but I have this. And they're going to tell you their concern. It's, it's, it's the right tonality. If you say, you seem hesitant, what's behind that? That's not going to work. John, can I, can I suggest something? Sure, go ahead. You seem hesitant when I was asking a few of those questions. What's behind that? That tonality? People open up to you. It's just like butter. Easy. So good. 
So when you have sales reps with kind of like spastic energy that are trying to like calm down and really get into the moment and like really connect with the prospect, uh-huh. what do you tell them to do? Like to fully yeah. control their tonality? Yeah. How do they work? Well, in our sales training programs, we have a, a version called NEPQ 3.0 and they don't just go through our virtual training course. We have a, like a 14 hour virtual training course. They go through weekly role playing with myself and and my team. We have six of those freaking role playing calls a week with myself and team. And we just role play and we work on the tonality because it's not just the, like I said, not just the question you're asking, it's how you're asking it. It's your pausing in between. Because when you first start talking to a human being, this is just like my background in college is behavioral science and human psychology. Okay. The study of the brain, neuroscience. When you're talking to a human being, all of you should understand what's going on in your mind. And it's the same thing that you do when you talk to a salesperson. It's all the same, guys. What goes on in their mind is they're looking for social cues in the first 30 to 60 seconds based on your tonality and what you are saying and what you were asking that trigger them to do one of two things. Either one, if you don't know how to do it the right way, it triggers sales resistance they throw up the wall. It's like red flag, red flag. The salesperson's trying to sell me. Okay. And they either reject you very quickly and get rid of you, or they say, Oh, this sounds really good. Andrew, can you send me some information? I'm going to get back to you in a week, a month, a year later. And then they go missing in action and they never return your calls or emails or texts. If you do it the wrong way. Now, if you do it the right way, if you understand NEPQ and you learn the right tonality and the right questions to ask in that beginning of that conversation, it triggers their brain to become so curious that it almost forces them to want to engage with you, okay, rather than trying to get rid of you like most salespeople do. So when we teach these like advanced role playing, we have to take a lot of salespeople because a lot of salespeople have been trained to like sledgehammer people in. Like you're doing it or else, right? It's like this weird mentality. Like that's, you know, the sales trainers out there that says, you know, it's, that's your money. Like get the money from the customer. Like you're going to struggle if you think that way about selling. Like people aren't, especially if it's going to, if it's more than a transactional sale, if it's more than like 500 or a thousand bucks, you're really going to struggle selling that way. So you have to, like I said, you have to calm down. You have to relax. And it's like a normal conversation that you have with your best friend or your grandma, except it's a skilled conversation. We're not talking about the weather or who won the game. None of that matters. When you start saying that stuff to a prospect in the beginning, they're just like, oh yeah, okay, get to the point. When you say, how are you today? I hope you're having a really good day. They know you don't care. It's just like small talk BS, right? So it's a skilled conversation. It's a relaxed conversation. And we train them how to have what we call collective confidence low-key relaxed we're here to see if we can help because maybe we can't so good (laughs) i i think we went into it already but if there's anything you'd like to add around eradicating sales pressure i'd love to hear it yeah um i actually took some notes um, let me go over those with you. Cause I, I actually wrote down some notes. I'm, you know, my wife says in my old age, I have amnesia. So sometimes if I don't write down the notes, I just like forget what you wanted me to go over. So I wrote some notes. I'm going to pull those up for you Sweet. on how to eliminate sales pressure from your conversations. Okay. Let me find those for you guys. I was working on this for this, for you guys this morning, you know, good quote, everybody should write down one of my good friends, uh, Brian Tracy, you know, the guy that's big sales trainer for 40 years. One of my first products I recorded with Brian and he said, every blind squirrel eventually finds a nut. Don't be the blind squirrel that just gets lucky here and there. You don't want to wing it. You want to have a structure. You want to be able to know exactly what to do from point A to point B to point Z to make sure you sell the most that you can. Okay. All right. So let's talk about how do you eliminate sales pressure in a conversation? Let me find that for you. Do, 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 do. You guys are enjoying this. Hit that heart button. Hit that like button. More engagement we get, more people we can reach, more people we can help. And uh, I think we've, we've already learned a lot already here today. 
So. Man, I haven't taught you guys anything. This is just me just blowing some smoke, you know, just throwing some things out. So here's what you want to do. If you want to be like a top salesperson or what we call a legend, okay? We even have shirts that say hashtag be a legend. We love this. It's all about neutralizing the hidden sales pressure that lies in the conversation that you're having with your prospects, okay? So remember, you need to focus on whether or not there's a sale to be made in the first place. One of the biggest things that salespeople have to learn is how to detach their self, themselves from the expectations of making the sale and instead focus on whether or not they can actually help that person solve their problems, okay? Because when you're detached from the expectations of making the sale, you take the pressure out of the conversation and you allow the customer to feel comfortable opening up to you, telling you the truth about their needs and their problems in order for you to move forward with, their, with, with your solution. Let me give you an example of this, okay? Uh, when the language you use in your sales calls is not trust-based, you immediately, like I said, social cues trigger sales pressure that leads to resistance very quickly, okay? There's a salesperson. He's now our CEO. I don't know if you guys know him. His name's Matt Ryder. Uh, he's now our CEO of the company, but he was one of my top students. And when he first came to me, this was a little bit over a year ago, he was already doing well. He was crushing it, making like 25 grand a year as a sales guy, okay? Now, most people would be like, okay, why would this guy um, who's making 25 grand a year, like why would he want more sales training, okay? The reason why is because what he would say is like, dude, I get up every day, I work 10, 12 hours a day, I try to sledgehammer people in and it works for certain people, but then people cancel, I have high attrition, they'll pay for a month or two and then they leave and he's like, I'm just like beating myself in the head, okay? So what we taught them is certain like, there's certain words that he's using when he's selling to those people that are actually triggering that resistance, that are actually triggering that buyer's remorse. And how do you actually get rid of those words? One second, I just lost where I was going in this conversation with you. Okay, here, I found it for you. I'm gonna give you some examples and I wanna make sure that I've got those right examples for you guys. Okay, all right. So when we, when we taught him those skills, his income went within three months from 25 grand a month to 65 grand a month, straight commission. Now he was making about hundred grand a month about a year later. It's because he learned how to take those words out that triggered some people to buy that should have been buying, okay? So when you use neutral language properly, you never trigger that rejection because the correct language is pressure free and your potential clients feel that from you, okay? And let me give you an example of that. Uh, typically, let's say that you have a first call and let me try to tailor this to what your people would do a first call. Let's say that they have a first call with one of their clients, okay? And they can tell that the person is really not ready to buy. It's got a bunch of questions, um, you know, or maybe they, it's a two-step close or something. There's many different circumstances. A lot of times people are trying to do this. Okay, John, that was a great call. Uh, tell you what, when can we get together tomorrow for another call? Um, do you want to talk tomorrow afternoon at 1 or Friday morning at 10? The old option close, right? The problem is here is that you're assuming that they want to have another conversation with you, right? So when you assume you become another, just another salesperson who they feel is just trying to sell them something, okay? You sound like every other salesperson who calls them every day. Therefore, they don't view you as anybody different in their mind. Okay, they commoditize you. They put you with this group of salespeople trying to sell them a house, trying to sell them a car, trying to sell them something at Best Buy. Traditional selling is focused on what? We're taught to focus on you have to make the sale on the first call. If you don't, we aren't selling. Now, that might be true if you're selling magazine subscriptions or something small, but when it's high ticket or something, you know, we do a lot of B2B sales, it's a little bit different. So when you try and push them, persuade them to move forward on that first call when they're obviously not ready, what is lost at that point? Mm -hmm. Trust. Trust is lost at that point. It's over at the first conversation. In other words, it's over at hello, okay? So what we wanna do is if they're not ready on that first call, 
because they feel that your intention is only to move them down your sales process so that you can make the sale so that you can make more money. If they feel that way, they throw out standard objections. Okay. Uh, and then what happens is that most salespeople or coaches go into objection handling mode and they start trying to convince them that they should buy from them right then and there. Now that's okay if you're on a one call or two close, because we teach people how to do both ways. Okay. But if they say, Hey, I want to talk to my spouse about this. Yeah, that's not a problem. Um, tell me, how does your spouse feel about, and then repeat back what they said they wanted. Okay. So let's say that they're selling, give me an example of what somebody might sell in your group. Oh, um, business development coaching. Okay. So how to scale their business or something. Yeah. Like a 5k offer for group coaching for business development. Okay. So that, okay. That's kind of generic, but I'll, I'll throw in there. So, okay. Yeah. That's not, that's not a problem. I need to talk to my spouse about this. Sounds good. That's not a problem. Um, how do I guess, how does your spouse feel about you learning the skills, the right skills in the business to actually double the ROI and profit margin in the next six to 12 months? Notice how I didn't say, how does your spouse feel about you buying coaching? Cause nobody buys the thing. Nobody buys the thing. They buy the results of your thing. Right? So notice how I'm implying, how do they feel about and repeat back what they said they wanted. Now, most people are like, oh, I think they would want that. And then I question them. Well, what are you going to do if you go to them to talk about getting the funding together to invest in the program to scale your business to seven figures this year? And they don't want you to put the money in. What are you going to do then? See how I'm prepping them. Okay. Oh, well, a lot of times people be like, oh, well, I'll just do it anyways. Like, it don't matter. Now, if they don't say that, well, I don't, I don't, I don't know what I would do. So, if your spouse doesn't want you to put the money into the business to get those skills to triple your revenue in the next 12 months to get you up to a million dollars a year profit margin, how are you actually going to get there if you don't learn the right skills? Consequence question. Okay. Do you see how we're prepping that? And then we just schedule and then we say, and then be like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll talk to my spouse. Okay. Well, what, what do you think you're going to say to your spouse though when you talk to him about doing this? Well, I would talk to him about this and about that. You have to almost coach them to do that. Okay. Can I make a suggestion to you? Yeah, sure. What if you talk to her about these problems that you mentioned to me about how you're not able to scale because you don't know this, this, and this, and that if you're able to get only this $5,000, that that would actually solve that. Would that help her understand it better? Oh, that's a great idea. That's a good idea. Okay. Well, what I can do, um, if you want to get with her a little bit later tonight, if you have your calendar handy, I can pull up mine and schedule a specific time with us tomorrow. That way you don't have to chase me down and vice versa. Would that be appropriate? And boom, you set up that second call. And most of the time it's going to be a close on that second call. Does that make sense? Totally. Good stuff. I feel like I'm boring everybody. No, they're, they're loving it. A lot of people are asking for your black book. So tell us a little bit about that, what they'll get inside of the black book. Yeah. So um, you asked me if I'd be willing to give away something. Um, yeah. I'm going to give everybody the, uh, what we call, it's just a bonus I do when I'm up on stage or something for people. So it's called the NEPQ black book of diffusing objections, not overcoming objections. This black book, I think it's, I don't know, it's probably 20, 25 pages. It's nothing long, but it's kind of a cheat sheet and it's going to go over a three-step formula of how to prevent objections from even happening. I'm more about objection prevention than objection handling because I would rather go into a sales call and not have any objections. Does anybody like that? I mean, I, do you like sales calls where there's no objections or do you like sales calls where they have 10 objections? <laughs> I heard a sales trainer say, the more objections you get, the more interested they are in buying. I'm like, bullshit. There is no science to that. There's no data to that. And that slaps reality in the face. The more objections you get, the more likely they're not going to buy. Because what about all the lay down sales that you never got any objections? What about those people? That makes no freaking sense. All that tells me is that your sales training that you're giving people doesn't really work. Sorry. I like to slap people around. So I'm more about objection prevention. How do you prevent the objection from happening? Now, if it does happen, I give you a three-step formula. First, how to clarify what the objection means. Because do you know what it means by them saying, I don't have enough money? What does that mean? You don't know what that means. It might mean something different to Sally, to George, to Andrew. It might be something different. So you have to clarify what that means. What's behind that? 
Then we have to discuss that, step number two, as a friend talking to a friend to work it out together. Selling is collaborative, not adversarial. It's not me against you. It's us working together to solve this problem, to come up with the solution, right? And then we're gonna learn what are called diffusing questions, NEPQ diffusing questions that get the prospect to overcome their own concern. Can you imagine learning questions that get the prospect to overcome their own concern rather than you giving stats and trying to fight with them and chase them down? How exhausting. I wanna throw up when I hear about that. So we're gonna give them the little black book of diffusing objection and they're even welcome like, we have a uh, Facebook group, probably not as cool as yours, but we have a Facebook group called the Sales Revolution uh, where I go live and my team's always like, you're going live too much, Jeremy. Like you're just going live too much. But I go live in there five times a week with different tips and training uh, for coaches, for salespeople, for business owners. And they're always welcome to jump in there and just listen to the lives if they want to. Hopefully I won't bore them to death in those, but they tend to be pretty good from what I've heard. So we'll give that to them too. Awesome. So if you guys want the black book, hashtag black book down below and we'll get it right over to you. And also, can they join? Is it a part of the in there somewhere they can join the Facebook group or we'll send them? Uh, yeah, group. just uh, just we'll send them a link. We'll send them a link. I'll, I'll send you a link when we're off here. It's just sales revolution with Jeremy Miner. I know it's kind of a cheesy name, but we are revolting. Yeah. We're, we're, we're revolting here. We're revolting traditional selling. So sales revolution on Facebook, Jeremy Miner, I'll send you a link. They're always welcome to join that. Like I said, probably not as cool as your Facebook group, but we do we do a lot of training in there for sure. I love it. Um, we'll get that over to you, everybody that hashtags black book down below. And Jeremy, the last question that I wanna end on is, what didn't I ask you that I should have asked you today? Uh, well, there's a lot to go through, but uh, probably That's don't have enough time. <laughs> What would be my best advice? Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. My best advice is to learn the right skills because there's a lot of people out there teaching skills, but do you know if they're the right ones? Now I know Andrew, what he does are the right skills because I've seen hundreds of testimonials and clients that he has. Some of his clients are our clients as well and they've talked about it. So he's teaching you the right skills. Um, so are you learning from the right people who have the right skills. Like if you want to learn how to crush it in sales, you know, one of the biggest things that I started doing when I was, when I was really young back in, in my early twenties is I would start questioning everything I was learning from different people. Like, are these the right skills, right? Like I'd read a sales book and I'm like, okay. And I looked up the sales trainer and I'd find out, oh wow, this, this sales trainer, when he was selling, he did pretty good. He made like 150,000 a year. But if I want to learn how to make 300,000 years a salesperson, how am I going to learn from somebody who never did it themselves? Or let's, you know, my biggest goal at that point was like, man, how do I become a millionaire? I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. I like, how to become a millionaire? I don't know anything about real estate, but can, can I become a millionaire in sales? So I'm like, what sales trainer out there made a million dollars a year as a salesperson before they started a business, right? Like when they were a salesperson selling mono to mono, who do I learn from? You want to learn from people who actually made what you want to freaking make. If you're learning from people who never did that and you're expecting to somehow be this, you know, multi-millionaire from somebody who never has gotten that themselves, you're just not going to learn the right skills because they never got to that themselves. So you have to learn the right skills, 100%. Mm. Learn the right skills from the right people. Exactly. Love it. Too many amateurs out there. I see so many amateurs out there that like hardly make any money do anything. And they're like the greatest in their mind. I'm the best coach in the world. I'm like, are you really? Yeah. yeah. So good. Um, if you guys want to learn sales, check out Jeremy's stuff. If you want to learn uh, growing coaching business, check out our stuff. Uh, Jeremy, thank you so much for everything today. We're going to give everybody the black book and your Facebook group. Really appreciate your time, brother. Anytime, Andrew, uh, heard a lot of great things about you over the last, I didn't know who you were until about a year ago, but uh, started seeing your ads and you probably started retargeting me and stuff. I think, I think my team even bought your course. Am I? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they bought our highest end mastermind. So you're- I didn't, even, I didn't even know. <laughs> like, I got some tag like a couple of months ago or a month ago and they're like, congratulations, Jeremy Miner, new client. And I'm like, did we buy something from the tribe of Irish? We're like, oh yeah, we bought the whole mastermind. I'm like, Okay, we'll get to work. Start learning that stuff.
<laughs> I love it, dude. Well, you're in there. We've been working hand in hand with uh, James and just absolutely crushing it. So, um, all right, man. I'm one of your clients now, baby. <laughs> Jeremy, thank you so much, dude. And uh, guys, thanks for being here. If you got anything out of it, hit that heart button, hit that like button. Let's get more engagement with more people. And uh, Jeremy, I'll see you around, man. All right, bro. Take care. Thanks, guys.